The Richmond Slave Trail is a walking trail that chronicles the history of the trade of enslaved Africans from Africa to Virginia until 1775 and away from Virginia, especially Richmond, to other locations in the Americas until 1865. Here we see the first three markers. Spanning nearly 350 years, the transatlantic slave trade displaced over 12 million Africans from their native lands to foreign soils. The victims experienced unimaginably inhumane, horrific circumstances as they crossed the Atlantic Ocean, a journey known as the Middle Passage. Their destination? The New World, primarily Brazil and the Caribbean. Roughly 4%, more than 480,000 of the Africans who had been torn from their homeland stepped onto the North American seaboard. The ships bringing slaves across the Middle Passage would cram as many slaves as they could into below deck compartments about three feet high where temperatures could reach close to 90 degrees. The stench was so horrid that even if there was room, the ship's officers couldn't enter the holding cells. When finally off the ships, the women were merely tied together with a rope around their neck. But for men, a strong iron collar was closely fitted by means of a padlock around their necks, a chain around 100 feet long was passed through the hasp of each padlock. Our next marker depicts the Creole Revolt. In October of 1841, Madison Washington and over a hundred other men were sold from Richmond's slave jails and ordered for export to New Orleans. Shortly after leaving the port at Hampton Roads and setting sail on the high seas, Washington rallied 18 of the other enslaved blacks and planned to take control of the ship. Secretly freeing themselves of their shackles and chains, the men surprised the crew on deck, seized hold of their weapons, and demanded the Creole set a course for Nassau, a British governed port in the Bahamas. Upon reaching their destination, all of the enslaved people on board the Creole were set free, despite the outcry of American slaveholders, including Robert Lumpkin, who had lost their investment. After a decade of dispute and the issuance of the Webster-Ashburn Treaty, assuring the British would not interfere in similar cases in the future, the joint Anglo-American Commission awarded $110,000 to the slave owners, finally closing the case. This marker describes how Richmond itself developed as small markets located on the falls of the James, so it is only natural the slave market would thrive here. The following two markers depict the change that begins to occur in the Americas as the importation of African slaves begins to dwindle. There was a notion by Americans in the early 1700s that African slaves, if freed, would be an economic burden. But by the late 1700s, Quakers and other small groups had begun to ban slavery. In 1778, Virginia passed a law banning the importation of slaves, but since Richmond was such a large slavery hub, they were able to change to an export business for the next hundred years. Virginia's early and widespread production of tobacco led to severe soil exhaustion throughout large portions of the state, decreasing the productivity of many agricultural farms. This condition, coupled with the natural increase in the enslaved population, led to a surplus of laborers and many Virginia communities found themselves with more enslaved Africans than they could support. Enslaved Africans were forced to walk along these river banks and into nearby cities, including Richmond, for further sale. As we finish moving along the south bank of the James River, we finish citing the accounts that focus on the brutal experience of the enslaved Africans exported as human cargo to foreign lands and begin to recite the story on the north side of the river speaking to the noble courage and the steely resilience of enslaved Africans in the United States who fought for their freedom in episodes such as the Creole Revolt. Passing the transitions marker, we begin heading down the Mayo Bridge. Ahead, various markers along the trail describe the lives of enslaved Africans after crossing the James. 
beyond the northern banks of the James was the community of free and enslaved black people who contributed considerable strength to building the capital city through the days of prosperity and peril. Much different than the concrete and steel bridges we see today, the earliest version of the Mayo Bridge was little more than a series of rickety pontoons tied together by wooden planks. The first three bridges were no match for the swirling floodwaters of the James, and by 1802, John Mayo found himself faced with the task of building the fourth iteration of the Mayo Bridge. To do this, he relied on a workforce often available for large-scale construction projects, a group of free and enslaved, black and white, local and regional workers contributing brute muscle as well as highly skilled craftsmanship. The use of arms marker depicts how slave labor was used to build the fortifications, work the factories, quarry the mines, fix the railroads, defend the harbors, tend the urban areas, and even serve as soldiers for Richmond. The James River and Kanawha Canal markers show how in Virginia and the rest of the United States waterways, both rivers and man-made canals served as main avenues of commerce. Ships from across the Atlantic and from other American ports transported goods that were transferred to smaller ships and bateaus, small boats designed to navigate shallow water, which in turn carried them further into the interior. Henry Brown, later known as Box Brown, was a slave who boxed himself up with the help of a white shoemaker and mailed himself to an abolitionist in Philadelphia. He did this after his wife and three kids were sold in 1848 spent 27 hours in the box. Here in Shaka Bottom were several auction houses, typically selling human goods, along with corn, coffee, and other commodities. Some sales were part of a larger business. Other auctioneers dealt exclusively in slaves. Most slave commerce was concentrated in a roughly 30 block area bounded by Broad, 15th, and 19th Street. Dedicated in 2007, identical statues reside in Liverpool, England, Benin, West Africa, and Richmond, Virginia, memorializing the British, African, and American triangular trade route, now identified as the Reconciliation Triangle. Traders profited from delivering over 114,000 Africans to Virginia between the 1600s and the American Revolution and at least 337,800 to other North American places before 1808. The triangle extended between Liverpool and other large British cities, Benin and other West African kingdoms, and Virginia and other North American colonies and states. Profits from the sale of enslaved Africans, profits from the commodities they produced, and the benefits of these products in Anglo-American lifestyles financed major British and North American economic development. Established in England in the mid-1700s, the Grand United Order of Oddfellows began a philanthropic organization that welcomed both white and black membership. The American chapters sadly did not honor their African American membership and denied all black or mixed race. Lumpkin's Jail, owned by Robert Lumpkin, who maximized profits in his compound by including lodging for slave traders, a slaveholding facility, an auction house, and a residence for his family. A port city with water, ground and rail connections, Richmond was linked to the slave buying markets such as Charleston and New Orleans. Enslaved Africans referred to Lumpkin's Jail as the Devil's Half Acre reflecting the despair and anger of people separated forever from their families. However, Mary Lumpkin, a black woman who was Robert's widow, boosted post-Civil War black education when, in 1867, she rented the complex to a Christian school, which evolved into Virginia Union University. Our final stop is the First African Baptist Church, which was founded in 1841, after white members of the First Baptist Church sold the building to its first thousand African American members, both free and enslaved, for $65,000. Although law required a white minister, 
enslaved and free African deacons and other church officers administered community matters as well as church affairs. The church became a center for Christian worship and an anchor for free and enslaved community development. I hope you've enjoyed the Richmond Slave Trail, a path of resilience, of strength, of conviction. The trail follows the path of a heritage that has been challenged and broken by the chains of supreme degradation and yet still found inspiration within itself. Please walk upon this trail, continue this journey, and accept the history revealed, for it is our history. May every step lead us all to a brighter future.